This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. On the whole, people generally don't like to kill each other. Most wars throughout history are often more about the agendas of the state's leaders than the soldiers on the field inherently feeling any real malice towards the people they're trying to kill or otherwise defeat. Few events in history illustrate this as well as a remarkable episode that took place during World War I when, despite the orders of their commanding officers and leaders, the soldiers threw aside their weapons, they got out of the trenches, and had a makeshift Christmas party with those that just hours before they'd been trying to kill. This momentous event has become known as the Christmas Truce. Leading up to this impromptu truce in 1914, Pope Benedict XV had asked that the various governments participating in the war could negotiate a truce for one day, so that the guns might fall silent at least upon the night the angels sang. There was also an open Christmas letter sent out by British women suffragists to the women of Germany and Austria asking for peace. The German women suffragists responded in kind, and an exchange of letters ensued where they discussed peace and the horror of modern war. In the United States, a resolution was submitted to the Senate attempting to get the warring countries to stop fighting for 20 days leading up to and including Christmas, with the hopes that the cessation of hostilities at the said time may stimulate reflection upon the part of the nations at war as to the meaning and spirit of Christmas time. The leaders of the warring nations paid little attention to these attempts at peace. The American Weekly, The New Republic, noted just before Christmas of 1914, If men must hate, it is perhaps just as well that they make no Christmas truce. The stench of the battle should rise above the churches, where they preach goodwill to men. A few carols, a little incense, and some tinsel will heal no wounds. A truce would be so empty that it jeers at us. But a somewhat alarming to the commanding officers and leaders of the nation's trends had already started occurring amongst the troops on both sides leading up to the truce. Stuck knee-deep in their muddy trenches, in lines so close together the soldiers on both sides who'd commonly thrown insults back and forth, they started adopting a slightly more apathetic view of the war, more of a live-and-let-live policy. In some cases, they even started tossing newspapers and other things back and forth, bartering for supplies like cigarettes, rations, and the like, and holding conversations across the trenches. As one Royal Engineer, Andrew Todd, said, Perhaps it will surprise you to learn that the soldiers in both lines of trenches have become very pally with each other. The trenches are only 60 yards apart at one place, and every morning about breakfast time, one of the soldiers sticks a board up in the air. As soon as this board goes up, all firing ceases, and the men from either side draw their water and rations. All through the breakfast hour, as long as the board is up, silence reigns supreme. But whenever the board comes down, the first unlucky devil who shows even so much as a hand gets a bullet through it. Another such temporary truce instance occurred on December the 19th, recounted by Lieutenant Jeffrey Heineke. A most extraordinary thing happened. Some Germans came out and held up their hands and began to take in some of their wounded, and so we ourselves immediately got out of our trenches and began bringing in our wounded also. The Germans then beckoned to us, and a lot of us went over and talked to them, and they helped us bury our dead. This lasted the whole morning, and I talked to several of them, and I must say they seemed extraordinarily fine men. It seems too ironical for words. There, the night before, we had been having a terrific battle, and the morning after, there we were, smoking their cigarettes, and they smoking ours. This type of behavior, perhaps inherent in any war where the two sides have to live and fight in such close proximity and for such a long duration, began popping up more and more in sections of the line, prompting the army leaders to issue strict orders forbidding any fraternization with the enemy. It's interesting to note that today something like this could never happen because our weapons and technology have become so advanced that we needn't actually see our enemy up close or even at all in order to attack and kill them. These incidents of temporary peace along the line typically didn't last very long and were never very widespread, as they happened in just small pockets. This changed, though, on Christmas Eve of 1914, beginning along the trenches near Ypres in Belgium. It is reported that it started with the Germans setting up Christmas trees, singing carols, and lighting candles. The British and French then responded in kind, singing along, and soon the two sides, in various places along the line, were wishing each other happy holidays. 
Even more surprising between these two groups that were previously exchanging shots and explosives was that they now began exchanging Christmas gifts, handshakes, hugs, playing games, drinking, and generally having a good time with one another. There are even reports of prayer circles formed with members of both sides taking part. In a letter home, one British soldier wrote, just you think that while you were eating your turkey, I was out talking and shaking hands with the very men I had been trying to kill a few hours before. It was astounding. Another soldier, Bruce Barron's father, noted, I wouldn't have missed that unique and weird Christmas day for anything. I spotted a German officer, some sort of lieutenant, I should think, and being a bit of a collector, I intimated to him that I had taken a bit of a fancy to some of his buttons. I brought out my wire clippers and, with a few deft snips, removed a couple of his buttons and put them in my pocket. I then gave him two of mine in exchange. The last I saw was one of my machine gunners, who was a bit of an amateur hairdresser in civil life, cutting the unnaturally long hair of a docile Bosch, a German who was patiently kneeling on the ground whilst the automatic clippers crept up the back of his neck. Those who were less enthusiastic about being friendly with the enemy also took advantage of this time, burying the dead and fortifying their trenches without fear of being shot. However, even then, the spirit of friendliness seemed to be prevalent. As one soldier noted in a letter home, I honestly believe that if I called on the Saxons for fatigue parties to help with our barbed wire, they would have come over and done so. Many soldiers wrote similar accounts in letters sent back home about the truce, but as this sort of behavior went against the massive propaganda campaign going on at home, trying to stir the general populace up against the enemy, the governments on both sides suppressed these letters and kept them out of the media for a short time. This ended when the New York Times published a story about the event on December 31st. On January 1st, 1914, the South Wales Echo also published an account of the event, stating, When the history of the war is written, one of the episodes which chroniclers will seize upon as one of its most surprising features will undoubtedly be the manner in which the foes celebrated Christmas. How they fraternized in each other's trenches, played football, rode races, held sing-alongs, and scrupulously adhered to their unofficial truce will certainly go down as one of the greatest surprises of a surprising war. The next day, the Daily Mirror even went so far as to say that the only real wartime hostilities that didn't need to be forced were those going on at home thanks to a gospel of hate spread by the nation's leaders, who incidentally, once the cat was out of the bag, tried extremely hard to downplay the extent of the Christmas truce in direct contradiction to many of the soldiers' letters. An excerpt from the Daily Mirror's article, the soldier's heart rarely has any hatred in it. He goes out to fight because that is his job. What came before, the causes of the war and the why and wherefore, bother him little. He fights for his country and against his country's enemies. Collectively, they are to be condemned and blown to pieces. Individually, he knows they're not bad sorts. The soldier has other things to think about. Consequently, he has not time for rage and blind fury only overwhelm him when the blood is up over fierce tussles in the heat of the thing. At other times, the childishness is apparent to him. But now, an end to the truce. The news, bad and good, begins again. 1915 darkens over. Again, we who watch have to mourn many of our finest men. The lull is finished. The absurdity and the tragedy renew themselves. As for the next Christmas, the truce did not repeat, nor any time after, as the fighting had become more intense and commanding officers were being more strict about fraternization. They also went so far as to plan artillery barrages on Christmas Day in many areas to make sure that the soldiers listened this time. However, there are a few reports of very isolated temporary truces that did happen in the Christmas of 1915, but it wasn't common, like the one in 1914, and even the reported truces were little more than ceasefires, rather than actually having something of a party with the opposing soldiers. That said, where there wasn't a temporary ceasefire, there were reports that many of the soldiers ordered to keep the artillery going throughout Christmas purposefully fired over the opposing trench, such that nobody in the trench they were supposed to be aiming at would be hurt. And speaking of stupid things like World War I, another stupid thing would be spending a boatload of time creating a website that you could just do incredibly easily with Squarespace, today's sponsor. Two simple things, maybe you've got some idea for a website or a business or a YouTube channel, something like that, knocking around in your head. And the second thing is the only way to figure out whether that's something worth pursuing is to get it out there into the world. And I know this can be daunting because making new things is always daunting. You don't know if people are gonna like it, but until you do it, you just don't know. And so don't make an excuse, make a website with Squarespace. It's a very easy thing to do. 
Squarespace allows you to create a powerful website for whatever you're up to. Want to sell something online? Yes, absolutely. Set up a store or a podcast, maybe a YouTube channel, or you want a website to complement that. It all starts on Squarespace with a beautiful template that you can customize to your heart's content. Or you could start from scratch or easily move over an existing domain, making everything super easy to manage. But don't start from scratch, just use a template. Like I say, no excuses. And once you've gone through the super easy customization process, there are no updates, there's no patches, there's no tech BS that you have to deal with. And Squarespace also handles all of that websitey stuff, podcasts, yep, mailing lists, oh yes, social integrations, indeed, and much more. Like I say, remove your excuses with Squarespace. Just go get started. You can do it today. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash brain food to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now for a bonus fact. Just as the Christmas truce was something of an impromptu event, so was the monument that stands commemorating it. In December of 1999, nine people traveled from Britain to Belgium wearing uniforms they'd made in an attempt to mimic those worn by the soldiers in 1914. They dug trenches, set up sandbags and things like that, and for a few days acted as if they were in World War I, eating rations and trying not to sink into the mud. After commemorating the Christmas truce, they filled in the trenches and left a wooden cross where they'd done all of this. They had not meant to set up any sort of official memorial, and the wooden cross was supposed to be temporary. But people nearby treated the cross so it would last in the weather, and they set it in a concrete base and planted flowers around it. So this sole monument to the time when, against all odds and orders, men from different warring nations stopped trying to kill one another, and instead, for one day at least, became friends. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Also check out our fantastic sponsor Squarespace, link below. And as always, thank you for watching.